This discussion is the result of this interesting thread of comments that I participated in on my review of Zork Nemesis. Huh, I guess the first review of my channel is still getting views. Thanks again for the discussion, man. It got me thinking, not about how games convey mood, tone, or even atmosphere, but what mood you have to be in to play certain games and how games affect our mood. Well, let's begin with a culprit of a crime, so to speak. Zork Nemesis, which as you may have seen in my review, is a game I really like. Zork Nemesis, in regards to story, characters, and tone, is a radical departure from past Zork games. Regardless of the fact that this was the first Zork game made without the Infracom label, this artistic decision can certainly make an impact on the player. People who have played past Zork games may feel betrayed. People who have never played the Zork games, yet may have heard of their light-hearted nature, or more specifically wanted a light-hearted adventure, may feel uncomfortable or bemused. The graphic sound and gameplay of Zork Nemesis generally had a favourable reception, but the most common complaint was the departure from past Zork games right down to the references to its characters, world building, lore and mythology, and even humour being scattered almost to the point of being entirely absent. However, what is most relevant about Zork Nemesis to this overall discussion is the mood you have to be in to play the game, or the mood someone may be looking for in a game. Is Zork Nemesis a game one would play to feel happy, better, etc? Probably not. I myself have got used to Zork Nemesis after multiple playthroughs to the point where it wouldn't give me a good cry, more on that later, if I needed one. So I would mostly play it today if I felt like playing a game that was familiar to me instead of trying a new one. Still, if Zork Nemesis wasn't lighthearted enough for you, there was the subsequent game Zork Grand Inquisitor. Humor is subjective, but that game is certainly funny in keeping with the heritage of the Zork series, and could potentially make someone smile or laugh if that's what they need on a bad day. This discussion doesn't begin and end with the Zork games, however. The two Legend of Zelda games, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, follow a similar pattern. The dark and surreal nature of Majora's Mask wasn't necessarily criticized by critics, but it certainly is a departure from its predecessor, regardless of the similar graphics engine and gameplay concepts. One of the most noticeable differences in Majora's Mask is the three day system, which generally makes the game less relaxing and leisurely than other Zelda games. Now let's not forget its safe system, which brings me to a game I especially want to bring into this discussion, Resident Evil. The first game in the popular survival horror series. Resident Evil, and indeed the other games in the series, is most certainly a game one would play for the sensation of feeling scared. The same with watching a horror film. Much like humor or comedy, horror is subjective where what we're scared of may be different to that of another person. But something that is surely not subjective is the less relaxing nature of Resident Evil. And it's not just because of it being placed in the horror genre. First of all, here's the context of the game for those of you who haven't played it. You play as either Quest, Redfield, or Jewel Valentine. You you and your teammates are investigating a series of disappearances and murders, only to find yourself trapped in a mansion, where zombies and traps and other monsters are everywhere. You have limited inventory slots, with two additional ones if you're playing as Jill, and a relatively limited number of saves, in the form of ink ribbons for typewriters, with the save points featured only at a few specific locations. This means you will surely have to backtrack to either save the game, or free up inventory slots for other items. And on top of this, your ammo is limited, the camera controls are not, shall we say, accessible, and the zombies and other enemies and traps don't help matters. Now, these are not necessarily my criticisms of the game, they make the game what it is. A challenging, intense, and potentially scary experience that keeps you alert and thinking. However, as much as I like the game, I have to be in a certain mood to play it. It's not something I can just relax with. The fact that I still haven't memorized what to do or where to go next after multiple playthroughs is my fault. Plus, if I have limited time in my adult life, I have to keep track of time and try my best to progress through the game as much as possible before the next possible save point. On your first time playing, the game may generally consist of trying to survive in between save points. You may last only for a few minutes or an hour or so, and then you can breathe a sigh of relief at a save room. I guess you can see where I'm coming from in this discussion. Regardless of whether a Resident Evil scares you or not, you may have to be in the right frame of mind to play it. Unless you can finish it quickly to the point of playing it just for the sake of it? Let me know if you can do that. Resident Evil 4, a game I've already reviewed, changes the save and inventory systems and to an extent the camera controls, so it feels to me like the rush to save your progress before doing your errands in the real world is less of an issue. But it doesn't necessarily stop that game from essentially being a survival horror action ride. There are of course differences between the original and remake versions of the first Resident Evil, but I'll get back to that in a review. Yep, that one will appear at some point. I mentioned in my review of Chrono Trigger 
that my discovery of it in 2012 helped me at a difficult time of my life. The fact that I played the game in the first place is something that surprises me a little, and I'm going to elaborate on that. During that difficult time, I did what any reasonable human being <clears throat> would do, play a video game to take my mind off things. I can't remember if I thought of playing a game I may have completed a million times before, but I do remember thinking I wanted to concentrate on figuring out how to play a game I had never really played before, and I settled on Chrono Trigger, given I spent the days leading to my first playthrough reading the manual and thinking to myself, okay, I think I've got a sense of what the game offers or what you generally have to do. It's not overly confusing, I'll play this game when I get the chance. Again, the game could have come at a better time when I wanted to take my mind off things. I spent hours on that game, and even more hours still, just so I could review the game for you people watching. Check it out if you haven't already. I would say the same thing about the game The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. That time in 2017 was difficult too. I vividly remember just coming home in the afternoons and turning on the game, only for time to fly. And I don't care that it did, given how much I like the game and still do. Are either of these games specifically good for coping with bad days and whatnot? Maybe. Chrono Trigger with its fun battle system and compelling story, and Breath of the Wild with its open world, where my plants would usually get delayed by a distraction, are, to me, exceptional games. Speaking of the Zelda games, even if something is light-hearted or colourful may not always necessarily mean you're in for a happy or relaxing time. I'm playing Kingdom Hearts for the first time as of this writing, and I'm button mashing and trying to strategize during battles. The Mario games can be challenging in their own right, some Zelda games are more typical than others, and the aforementioned Zork games are adventure games, a genre notable for a tendency to include frustrating or illogical puzzles. Even the age of a game can impact the player. Zork Nemesis is an old game, as was mentioned in the comments thread on YouTube, and some aspects of old games have either not aged well or may not be fun to play around with regardless of context or the era it was developed in. I'm sure at least one person would say about Super Mario Bros. today, why are there no save points? Why is it after a game over I have to start at the beginning? Actually, that is mostly hypothetical. I haven't really heard or seen anyone say that, I assure you. I'm sure a lot of this discussion is mostly obvious to anyone watching this, right down to the fact that when choosing to watch specific films, you may have to be in the right mood to watch it, which applies to games as well. I want something light-hearted. I want something serious. I don't care either way. But maybe this discussion could broadly include the developers' decisions to make the game what it is, as well as the technology they had to work with at the time. When playing or even analysing video games, the context of mood and age is probably something to take note of. For example, Final Fantasy VII really blew people away on its release, something which may be hard to relate to if you're like me and have only played the game recently. People who played it when they were young may not have got some of the more sophisticated concepts, or even adult concepts. Don't worry, it's not that mature of a game. Older people may have related to the story, the characters or the subject matter maybe even understood the strategies to be utilised in the game. Final Fantasy VII can be generally described as an artistic game. There we go again with the video games being art discussion. And many of us can only hope that the remake of Final Fantasy VII can affect our mood positively when we get to play it. Goodness knows when it will come out. The graphics and especially the music could make us feel emotion. We could relate to the characters and story and customise for battles all over again. What mood are you in to play such a game? Have you played the original Final Fantasy VII, let alone like it? Do you want it to give you a smile or laugh, or make you relax, or think differently at the end of a bad day? While you answer those questions for me, I will say this. Not only do I want that remake of Final Fantasy VII to come out somehow, but I also want a good cry out of it, if it's going to feature that notable death scene again. Well, that's my discussion about the mood of a player playing video games. See you next time. Fiddy, why did you say notable death scene? The game was released in 987. People would say it's too old to be exempt from spoilers. I mean, even you knew who was going to die, and you still played the... Wait, it's still recording? Ah.